Okay, here we are on the uh, <clears throat> operations section of the EMT program. And uh, operations includes a variety of things. And one of those would be preparing for the call. And preparing for the call certainly might include uh, the type of ambulance that you have. Uh, there essentially are four types of ambulances. Type 1 is a, a modular body that's mounted on a truck frame. Uh, there is no communication between the truck and the box. Um, that makes it a, a, a type 1. Uh, type 2 is in a van. Uh, so a type 2 ambulance is a van that comes in a variety of uh, sizes. It may be extended in length, extended in height, uh, or it may be a little mini transport van like this. Uh, a type 3 ambulance is a modular box that's mounted on a chassis, a truck chassis, but there is communication between the box and the cab. It might be in the form of a sliding little door. It might be the form of a window, uh, but there is communication between the cab and the box. And then a medium duty is the fourth type of ambulance, and we don't see many of these around, but uh, certainly they do exist. They're huge, uh, uh, you know, medium semis almost. Uh, you see these mainly in, you know, perhaps larger cities or perhaps uh, a, a, a situation where uh, you need the additional size of the of the truck in order to carry the uh, equipment in the box that you're needing for the job that you do. So as an example, a, a mobile intensive care unit might need a medium duty ch chassis to mount on. Um, as far as ambulance supplies and equipment goes, uh, you know that certainly an ambulance without proper equipment uh, may have its agency cited and fined uh, a considerable amount of money by a state EMS regulatory agency, but that really doesn't occur in Iowa. Uh, the state of Iowa certainly has uh, discussed the uh, possibility of, um, you know, perhaps if a EMS service does not meet the minimum standards, assessing some sort of fine, but with the you know vast majority of all EMS services in Iowa being volunteer, uh, that's just not something that's happened in Iowa. Uh, it's important that you know where all the supplies are and what they're used for. Uh, also have a way of knowing when the supply uh, should be used. Um, you know, here's a person doing a uh, check of the ambulance. Uh, may be done uh, at the beginning of your shift. It may be done at a monthly uh, volunteer meeting. Uh, but it's important that you go through the truck on a regular basis uh, to check the interior surfaces, the, pol the upholstery, uh, make sure that all the uh, equipment is ready to use. Um, now, on a full-time service, that may, be, that may be done at the beginning of every shift. You check your truck in. Um, cabinets that are fully stocked may have a lock on them, uh, a simple uh, zip tie that um, uh, tells you that uh, nothing's been used out of that cabinet and there's uh, everything that should, should be in there. Uh, when stuff needs to be used, the zip tie is broken uh, and a uh, quick visual with the absence of the zip tie would tell you that something was taken out of that cabinet and you need to do an inventory of it. It's really important, too, that you walk around and check the uh, ambulance body, the wheels, the tires, the windshield wipers, the oil, the uh, antifreeze, brake fluid. Uh, all those things need to be evaluated on a regular basis. Uh, so inspecting the ambulance with the engine off, inspect the body of the vehicle, report any damage, uh, inspect the wheels and tires, look for damage and worn uh, wheel rims as well as damage and worn tires. Uh, check the tread depth. Uh, use a pressure gauge to uh, check the uh, pressure in the tire. There are many services that have devices that either automatically monitor the pressure of the tire and send a message uh, to the uh, console uh, or something as simple as a cat eye that uh, as long as the uh, pressure is maintained within the tire, um, the device on the uh, valve stem resembles a cat eye. Uh, inspect the uh, windows and mirrors, look for broken glass, loose or missing parts, uh, make sure the mirrors are clean and properly adjusted, and that will vary from one individual to the next. So, you know, when you take over the ambulance and it's your turn to um, uh, uh, staff this ambulance, it's important that you make sure that the mirrors are adjusted for you if you're going to be driving it. Check to make sure that all the doors work, the latches and locks work, 
uh, check all your fluid levels, uh, inspect the battery, and make sure the cable's nice and tight, inspect the interior surface of uh, the upholstery for damage, cleanliness, uh, wipe down the steering wheel with a disinfectant. Um, you know, that's probably one thing that we don't do very well. Uh, the microphones on the radios, the steering wheels, uh, keyboards to the computers, uh, any of the, any of those things that multiple people are going to touch, cough on, breathe into, uh, it's probably a good idea to wipe that stuff down before your shift. Check the windows for operation and cleanliness, test the horn, the siren, the lights, adjust the seat and the belts to ensure that they're working properly. Again, check the fuel level, and uh, if necessary, make sure that you have the fuel that you need. There'd be nothing more embarrassing than responding to a call and running out of gas. So look under that hood, check all the things that you need to do. Uh, if you've got dash-mounted indicator lights, uh, turn on your vehicle. Make sure that you don't have any problems with your oil pressure, engine temperature, uh, or the vehicle's electric system. Uh, look at dash-mounted gauges to make sure that everything's working properly. Um, you know, depress the brake pedal and note the, uh, uh, the pedal travel uh, that might indicate that the brakes are spongy or uh, need to be replaced. Uh, check air pressure uh, as needed. Test the parking brake. Uh, move the transmission level to a drive position and, and replace the uh, level to the park position as soon as you're sure that the parking brake is holding. Uh, turn the wheel from side to side to make sure that the power steering pump works. Check the operation of the windshield wipers and washers. Uh, the glass should be clean uh, each time the blades move back and forth. Uh, turn on the vehicle's warning lights. Have your patient walk around. Make sure your turn signals work, your... Op uh, your um, uh, markers are all on. Um, turn on other vehicles' lights, your headlights, um, high and low, your uh, turn signals, your four-way flashers, your brake lights, uh, box marker lights, those sort of things. Uh, check the operation of the heating and air conditioning system. Uh, check uh, the onboard suction to make sure that it works. Uh, check, test your radio, both your portable and your fixed radios. Uh, if your unit is equipped with a backup camera, make sure that that's working. Uh, most people are going to have a supply, a, a vehicle checklist uh, that um, uh, identifies all the things that you need to check and uh, make sure that uh, you complete that vehicle checklist and that you check off all the items uh, for completeness, uh, condition, and operation. Check the uh, supplies, the interior equipment, the exterior equipment. Check the pressure of the oxygen cylinders. Um, occasionally, this is certainly something that you do every uh, shift, but uh, things like the air splints need to be uh, inflated once in a while uh, to examine them for leaks. Um, test the oxygen and ventilation equipment for proper operation. Examine the rescue tools. Uh, operate any battery-powered devices to make sure that the batteries have a proper charge to include your heart monitors, your pulse oximeters. Uh, also, check your vacuum splints to make sure that they don't have any holes in them. Now, some equipment, such as an AED, may require additional testing, and uh, typically they don't. I mean, typically your AED goes through a self-test daily, weekly, and monthly, uh, and if there is a problem, uh, that it's noted on the handle or uh, the uh, device may chirp. Um, there may be a, a green light, red light to indicate good or bad. Um, so when you see those things, uh, it's important that you record those and um, uh, have those devices examined to make sure that everything is, is functional. Uh, you want to complete the inspection report, correct any de deficiencies that you find, replace missing items. Uh, make sure that you're uh, aware of any deficiencies that cannot be uh, immediately corrected. Um, and then clean the unit. Uh, you know, ambulances, uh, certainly the back of the ambulances, uh, should be some of the more cleaner places uh, that you uh, take patients. Um, the role of the emergency dispatcher is to ask questions of the caller and assign the priority of call. Is this an emergency? Is this a non-emergency? Is this a uh, ambulance only? Is this an ambulance fire and rescue? Um, and they may be able to provide pre-arrival medical instructions to the caller, like uh, how to do CPR, uh, those sort of things. Uh, they also will dispatch and coordinate all your EMS resources that you may need, those additional resources that you ask for once you get on scene, and they may also coordinate with other public safety agencies as well. 
Um, questions they may ask is, you know, what is the where, what is the exact location of the patient? What is your callback number? What's the problem? How old is the patient? What's the patient's sex? Is the patient conscious? Is the patient breathing? Um, and um, it may seem like they're asking lots of questions and callers may get extremely frustrated with them, but it's important that they get all that information so that they can give you uh, appropriate information you need uh, to get safely to the scene. Now, being a safe ambulance operator means that you're physically fit and you're mentally fit. Uh, you've had an adequate amount of rest. Uh, you're, you've uh, taken in an adequate amount of nutrition. Uh, you have to be able to perform under stress as an ambulance uh, operator. Um, you know, that's certainly a new term, uh, not a new term. Uh, we used to be called ambulance drivers. Uh, oh, you're an ambulance driver. You drive a bus or you drive the truck. Um, uh, regardless of your role, uh, you have to be able to perform under stress. Uh, you need to have a positive attitude about your ability as a driver, but not being overly confident. You have to drive defensive. Uh, don't assume that because you're running lights and sirens that everybody's going to see or hear you. You need to be tolerant of other drivers. They may have things going on in their vehicle, uh, like texting or talking on the phone, not paying attention, eating, uh, those sort of things. And they may not hear you or they may not see you in their rearview mirrors uh, right away. Uh, it is very important that as a volunteer that you never drive under the influence of any substance. Uh, in the event of a crash, one of the first things they will do is take your blood alcohol. Uh, they'll do a, a drug screen to see that it, whether or not you were under the influence of any drugs or alcohol prior to the crash. Uh, being a safe ambulance operator includes uh, never driving while taking prescription medicines that can impair your ability to operate a motor vehicle. Uh, never drive with a restricted license. Always wear your glasses or contact lenses if you're required to do so. Uh, evaluate your ability to drive based on your stress, your illness, your fatigue. And if you can't drive, turn it over to somebody else. It's important that you understand the law as well. An ambulance operator must have a valid driver's license. They may also be required to complete a training program. Uh, Iowa dictates that uh, drivers of an ambulance, if that's all you're going to do is drive an ambulance, that you have to have adequate training in how to drive an ambulance. You have to have a valid driver's license, and you have to have CPR as well as radio communication training. Now, remember that driving is a privilege in most states. It's a privilege that's granted under law to the operator, uh, but it is not a right. It is not a guarantee. Uh, driving is, uh, is just that. It's a privilege and uh, doesn't give you the ability to drive with disregard for the safety of uh, public or others. Um, so even though in an ambulance with lights and sirens, you can go down a one-way street the wrong way, uh, you can uh, go through a red light. Um, in being able to do that, uh, that doesn't mean you do it in an unsafe manner. Uh, these are privileges that are granted during emergency situations only, uh, and you must be using warning devices when you do break the law. Uh, most statutes allow parking uh, wherever it's necessary as long as life and property are not in danger, uh, going through stop signs or signals, exceeding the posted speed limit, uh, passing other vehicles in a no-passing zone. Again, all of these things must be done within, with the due regard for the safety of the public and others. Uh, if it's believed that, uh, you know, you zip through a stoplight and hit somebody in the intersection, uh, you weren't paying attention to traffic coming into that intersection. Uh, you cannot assume that those people that are, <clears throat> you know, coming into the intersection see you or hear you. Um, uh, most statutes allow you to disregard regulations that govern direction of travel uh, or, uh, you know, going, d going the wrong way on a one-way street. Uh, and laws are interpreted by the court based on, again, whether or not you did this with due regard for the safety of others uh, and whether to the best of your knowledge that you were responding to an emergency. Uh, you know, if you're running hot or you're running lights and sirens uh, to go pick up a pizza uh, or do something like that, you know, that certainly is uh, uh, going to and has uh, gotten people uh, in trouble. Uh, using the warning devices, um, 
you know, the siren should never be used indiscriminately. Uh, you should use the horn when necessary, as well as uh, lights. Most uh, statutes would require that if you're going to run lights, you also have to run sirens. Uh, you know, many people may consider running silent. Uh, but if I run silent, uh, like if I'm in a big city and I'm trying to get into a hospital, um, you know, running lights and sirens may be something I do, or I may just run lights. But if you choose to run just lights, you have to drive the speed limit. You have to stop at all stop signs uh, and then proceed. You have to drive like any prudent driver would. Uh, in most situations, if you want to uh, disobey the law to get there quicker, then you need to run both lights and sirens. Um, excessive speed is going to increase your probability of collision due to reaction time and stopping distance. Uh, as speed increases in these big heavy ambulances, stopping distance also uh, increases and uh, you need to make sure that you're not driving at a speed faster for the conditions of the road. Uh, most protocols, I know where I'm at and around our area, uh, you're limited to driving no more than 15 miles over the posted speed limit. Uh, any faster than that, and uh, uh, certainly uh, you can become a, uh, uh, a hazard. Um, when you're uh, looking at something like an escort or a multi-vehicle response, uh, an inexperienced ambulance operator will use an escort, um, but it's really important that, I mean, most systems, most courses would tell you never to use an escort. And the reason that they tell you that is that, you know, as you and the escort are flying down the road and you're assuming that everybody moves out of the escort's way, uh, if the escort has to stop suddenly and you're not paying attention or you're traveling too close, you're going to run right into them. Or if the escort gets through the intersection and then cars continue and then you plow into the intersection, that's where accidents occur. So it's recommended not to use an escort unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and when you do, greater care must be used. Um, you know, factors that affect your response include the day of the week, time of the day, the weather, uh, the maintenance of the road, railroads, bridges, tunnels, schools and school buses. Uh, but what's interesting, when you look at most motor vehicle collisions, uh, they occur during normal daylight hours on straight roads with normal weather uh, on good uh, roads. No hills, no turns, no ice storms, uh, none of those sort of things. Um, many services are using GPS or global positioning satellites now uh, that will help navigate them to a scene. Um, you know, just because you have GPS doesn't mean that you shouldn't be knowledgeable about where things are in your area. Um, and GPS has may become a distraction. Uh, you will need to have detailed maps of your service area, and they may need to be updated annually. Um, uh, you know, minimize your lights and sirens only to uh, 1033 hot emergencies. Uh, you know, driving with lights and sirens involves high risk. Make certain that you're always wearing your seatbelt. Uh, know where you're going before you respond, uh, but you certainly could use GPS to check and, and verify you're going where you uh, believed you should be. Uh, be familiar with your response area. Um, uh, come to a complete stop at intersections, even though you have the right of way to go through it. You know, blowing through an intersection is one way to certainly uh, hit somebody in the intersection, which is the number one type of motor vehicle collisions involving EMS response vehicles is a intersection uh, collision. Uh, don't be a distracted driver. Have the crew leader, leader operate the radio, operate the sirens, operate the GPS, operate the computer, uh, operate other devices while you focus on your driving. Uh, pay complete attention to safe driving. Um, 
Uh, keep unnecessary units and people off the highway. Avoid crossovers unless a turn can be completed without obstructing traffic. Uh, if yours is the first unit on the scene, uh, remember to park the apparatus upstream from the incident. Wear your personal protective equipment to include uh, bright visible vests on any sort of highway incident. Uh, you may set out uh, cones, set up flares, uh, reduce your emergency lighting so as not to blind uh, vehicles that are uh, coming towards you. Uh, your unit placement is important. Typically, somebody's on scene by the time you get there, but if not, remember to uh, place your vehicle upstream. Uh, when backing up, uh, you should probably avoid it if at all necessary. Uh, if you have to back up during an emergency, it's a good idea to have a, a spotter uh, to help you back up. Uh, select the proper patient carrying device when moving patients. Um, you know, long spine boards have, have uh, you know, quick become the uh, method of choice to move a patient. Uh, and they're still okay to move a patient from point A to point B. But once you get them to uh, point B, you need to remove them off the device. Uh, packaging the patient for transfer may be a challenge depending on the patient's injuries. Uh, move the patient to the ambulance uh, and then load the patient into the ambulance. Um, you know, packaging the patient includes readying the patient to be moved and combining patient and patient carrying devices uh, as the unit is being ready for transfer. Uh, sick or injured patients must be packaged so that conditions uh, are not aggravated. Um, before placing a patient on any sort of carrying device, it's important that you uh, take care of uh, wounds and other injuries if time and condition of the patient allows. Certainly, if I have a patient who has a life-threatening injury, I'm not going to spend uh, lots of time on scene uh, bandaging all the wounds and splinting every suspected boo-boo, those sort of things. Um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, take care of immediate life threats and move the patient quickly. Um, stabilize impaled objects so that they don't get pulled out, which may increase the risk of bleeding. Uh, check dressings and splints. Uh, make sure that you keep the patient warm. Um, the patient must be secured to the patient carrying device because as you're moving them, they could easily roll off or fall off the patient securing device. So we want to put them on a device uh, so that they can't move up, down, left, or right. Uh, as a minimum, three straps to secure the chest, the waist, and the lower extremities. If you have the ability to add a, uh, a shoulder harness, by all means, consider that as well. When protecting the EMT, remember that you're at greater risk in the patient compartment than the, than the patient. The patient is strapped to the scot, cot, the cot is uh, strapped to the floor, uh, so there is some protection in the event of a collision. You, on the other hand, may not even be belted, may be up and moving around, and should there be a, a collision, you're at great risk of becoming injured. Make sure that all your equipment in the back of the ambulance is secured in case the ambulance comes to a sudden sta stop or would be hit or roll over. Uh, remain seated, uh, wear seat belts and harnesses if at all possible, uh, and avoid unnecessary movement during the transfer. Um, during transfer, you're going to continue your assessment of the patient or what we call reassessment, uh, checking the patient as if you've never seen them before. Uh, you're going to secure the stretcher in, in the ambulance. You're going to position and secure the patient on the cot, adjust your straps, and uh, uh, be alert for if you got them strapped too tight, their inability to breathe well, uh, or if they were to go in cardiac arrest, your need to uh, have them in a position where you could begin CPR. Loosen restrictive clothing. Try to make them comfortable. If you have a relative or friend who can accompany the patient, that's always a good thing to do as long as they don't interfere with patient care. Uh, make sure you bring along all their personal effects, their hearing aids, uh, those sort of things. Um, talk to your patient. You know, this may be your uh, 700th call, but this may be the patient's first ambulance call. They have no idea what you're going to do. You know, let them know there's going to be some bumps. Let them know it's going to be a little bumpy loading them into the ambulance. Let them know it's going to be bumpy bouncing down the road a little bit, depending on the type of ambulance that you have. Uh, avoid letting patients sit on the bench or the airway seat. Those are areas that are reserved for you. The patient needs to sit on the cot. Uh, you want to notify the uh, patient. You want to notify the hospital as soon as you can uh, that you're en route with a patient and tell them what's going on with the patient. During the uh, trip to the hospital, you're going to continue providing emergency care. 
Uh, you're going to, you know, use safe practices like wearing seat belts. Uh, if, uh, you know, as an EMT, you're certainly not going to start an IV, but, you know, those sort of things, the ambulance may need to stop and uh, come to the side of the road in order for those uh, uh, uh types of treatment to occur. Uh, you're going to gather as much additional information as you can on the patient, reassess their uh, vital signs, and uh, again, uh, n notify the receiving facility of your arrival. Uh, pediatric note, uh, make sure that the entire, well, the entire scene may create a terrifying experience for a child, particularly if a caregiver isn't present. So if you have the ability to offer the child a tear a toy, uh, like a teddy bear or a stuffed animal that may be in your ambulance for just that purpose, uh, that may be what's necessary to, to calm a frightened child. Uh, the presence of a female EMT or police officer may be helpful with children as well. Um, and remember that ch small children do not, as a rule, carry any sort of identification. Um, when you transfer the patient over to the emergency department staff, uh, if it's a routine admission situation, then uh, you've got time to uh, check in first to see uh, what is to be done with the patient, where they're going to go, what room do they need to go in, uh, and you can assist the emergency department staff uh, by um, helping move the patient into that uh, cot or their gurney, uh, and then providing a thorough verbal report uh, about the patient's condition before leaving. Uh, as soon as you're free from the patient care activities, then you need to start writing your patient care report uh, and uh, transfer any of the patient's personal effects. Make sure that you don't leave them in the back of the truck. Uh, and then if there's a necessary need to, some facilities or certainly some services would have you uh, get a signature from the nurse or the physician that takes care of the uh, patient. Uh, at the hospital, clean the patient compartment uh, while taking appropriate standard precautions. Uh, prepare uh, the respiratory equipment for uh, service again. Replace any uh, expendable items. Uh, exchange equipment according to your local policy. Now, many facilities uh, may have an equipment exchange program. They may have uh, supply cupboards out in a garage that uh, they may tell you, hey, you know, when you bring a patient in, feel free to help yourself to whatever additional supplies you need to restock your truck when you leave. Um, make up the ambulance cot, uh, clean the floor with some sort of disinfectant, uh, one part bleach, nine parts water is, is uh, uh, really a, a highly effective disinfectant. Uh, en route to your quarters when you're going back to your base, uh, radio the emergency medical dispatcher to let them know where you're at. Um, air the ambulance out if that's something you need to do, refuel the ambulance if that's something you need to do, restock the ambulance if that's something you need to do, um, which is what they're doing here. Uh, place badly contaminated linens in a biohazard container and non-contaminated linens in a regular hamper. Uh, as necessary, clean any equipment that, the, uh, that touched the patient. Uh, clean and disinfect uh, items that were used that were non-disposable uh, respiratory assist and inhalation therapy equipment. Uh, clean and sanitize the patient compartment. Uh, prepare yourself for service. Uh, place expendable, uh, replace expendable items. Refill oxygen cylinders if they're low. Uh, and replace patient care equipment. Uh, carry out post-operational vehicle maintenance procedures. Clean the vehicle. Complete all your paperwork. Um, and when you call for air rescue, that may be an operational decision because it may be faster to get the patient uh, to a, a larger facility to care for their uh, injury or illness. Uh, so speed of transport is, is certainly something that you consider. In many locations, it, it isn't any faster uh, to call a helicopter to come and get the patient and take them back to their uh, location, especially if the hopper, if the helicopter has, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute on scene times when they land. Uh, when extrication of high priority patient is prolonged, you might call for a scene flight. Uh, when the patient must be rescued from a remote lo location, like a mountainous area or something like that, there may be a place where a helicopter can land. Uh, some clinical reasons when to call air support. Uh, if you have a patient who has a serious life threat, like they're in shock, 
they have a serious head injury, they have altered mental status, they have significant chest trauma with respiratory distress, they have penetrating injuries, particularly to the, uh, uh, the thorax, chest or abdomen. Uh, if they've got an amputation um, uh, above their uh, hand or foot, if they've got extensive large burns, more than 10% of their body surface area, if they have a serious mechanism of injury, uh, if they're a post-cardiac arrest patient that now you have a pulse. Um, you know, oftentimes you can just call the dispatcher and tell them to dispatch a uh, helicopter. You may call the hospital, tell them to dispatch a helicopter. Uh, but should you have to uh, make the call yourself, know that they're going to want a name of the person and a callback number, an agency name, the nature of the situation, the exact location that you can give them, uh, a description of a landing zone, and then your GPS coordinates if at all possible. You're going to describe the landing zone to their rescue service as well. What sort of terrain are they going to land in? What sort of major landmarks are available? Uh, what is the distance to the nearest town? And then other uh, pertinent information such as down wires or high line wires, ditches, and wind direction. Now, to safely land a helicopter, they would love to have 100 by 100 feet. Uh, but we know that's not always uh, true or not always something that they can uh, manage. Uh, the area located in red there, uh, you would need to be very cautious uh, when approaching a helicopter on a landing strip uh, from that particular location. Uh, any other area is out of, out of service. Any area outside that uh, red diagram there, uh, the very back of the helicopter, as well as the very back sides are off limits and not anywhere that you would uh, approach a helicopter from. Um, uh, the area around the tail rotor is an extremely dangerous area. That spinning rotor often cannot be seen. Uh, many of the newer helicopters have a cage around that spinning rotor so that um, if for some reason somebody walks back there, uh, they don't get hit in the head with that spinning rotor. Uh, do not approach unless you are escorted by flight personnel. Uh, allow the crew to direct the, lo the loading of the patient. Stay clear of all tail rotors at all times. Keep all traffic and vehicles at least 100 feet away from the helicopter. Do not smoke near the aircraft. Uh, be aware of uh, danger uh, areas. Uh, oftentimes, you should not approach a helicopter uh, unless you're told to by the uh, pilot. You want to look at the pilot, be able to make eye contact with the pilot, and uh, as you approach the, the helicopter, uh, make sure that if you're uh, six foot or taller, uh, that you duck. Uh, those blades can dip down as low as four feet uh, in the wind as they're spinning around, uh, so it's really important that you crouch low uh, and that you approach in direct visual contact of the uh, pilot and crew. All right, so that's the operations section, and uh, if you have any questions, you know how to uh, get a hold of me. Uh, we're down to just a, a few chapters left over, uh, so I will, uh, I'll be talking to you soon.